I'm Eva, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our craft. This is a project snapshot episode, which means I'll only be talking about my works in progress and going into a lot of detail about them. I'm hoping that the lighting cooperates. Today is daylight savings here in the U.S., and that means that we have gained an hour by the clocks going back an hour, which is wonderful, except I just realized that that meant that now the sun sets a little before 5 p.m. instead of a little before 6 p.m. So I forgot that that would happen, and I'm just starting recording at 4.30, and my apartment gets a lot of the evening golden hour light. So hopefully it won't get too bad. This is my co-host Thistle, my little puppy, and my cat Moth is currently right behind the camera in the windowsill, hunting. So let's get to the projects. I have four projects to talk about, two that you've seen and two that you haven't. So I suppose I will talk about one of the new ones first. Perhaps if I don't make a cascade of knitwear, picking it up. So this is my Wild Roses Tam. Sorry, Thistle. Woohoo, we're going to have cooperative focus today. I forgot to put the focus setting that I've been using on my last episode. That's why the focus is weird. But I, I have gone back to my old lens because I just think it looks better. Okay, sorry. Enough about the technical rambling. Let's get to the knitting. So this is the Wild Roses Tam. Well, that's my name for it. And it is based on the Rosewater pattern by Tin Can Knits, which a very generous viewer gifted me. And I really, I've admired this pattern for so long. It's, the lace is an original design. It's not from any stitch pattern. And it's inspired by an Art Deco, very famous artist from Scotland. And yet, I'm a Philistine. And so, I believe his name is McKinnon. I know he's really famous. I was looking at a lot of his artwork on Google to learn more about him, and I actually preferred his wife's artwork. She was also very instrumental in the Scottish Art Deco movement. But yes, so that is where the inspiration came from. These are very stylized roses, which you can kind of tell already. So I finished one repeat. The yarn is Jacob's DK, which is from West Yorkshire Spinners. It's a new breed of sheep for me. And if you hang on one moment, I can get the yarn tag and show you the cute little sheep. So this is the Jacob sheep. Isn't it adorable? They can have various numbers of horns which is wonderful and they tend to be piebald which is pretty unusual for sheep so yes this is 100 percent jacob british wool and it's a dk weight and it's 253 yards to 100 grams so there's the west yorkshire spinners label i bought it from webs i was ordering something else and i noticed that they had skeins of this for nine dollars which was not very much money to try a new breed of sheep i really enjoy um testing out breed specific yarns and seeing how big of a difference that can make to the yarn so yay jacob sheep is another one to add to my breed specific collection this line of yarn only comes in the natural sheep colors i ordered ecru which is the natural cream and when it arrived, it was too yellow for me to wear on its own, so I dyed it. I decided to dye it pink because I lost my only other pink hat, and as I wear a lot of pink, I knew that I needed to replace it. So, to dye this, I used both Kool-Aid and Wilton's icing dye. I used one packet of grape Kool-Aid, two packets of cherry Kool-Aid, and then a little bit of Wilton's Sky Blue and about half that of the Wilton's Buttercup Yellow. And the blue and yellow together obviously make green, and green is the complementary of red, or pink in this case. And that's complementary with an E. And so 
Kool-Aid colors are very bright, but if you mix in a little of the complementary, it makes the color muted, it tones it down. So I really enjoy this kind of dyeing since it's with food safe dyes. I don't have to worry about fumes or anything like that with my pets in my small apartment, and it's just very relaxing. What I have found is that, you know, you're not limited to that first dye bath. It was a little too bright when the first one came out, and so I just kept um, mixing up new, slightly different dye baths until I got what I want. And I really love the finished color. It's exactly what I was going for, a kind of tea rose color, which is why I thought it would be perfect in combination with this pattern. Let's see. It's interesting. So this is regular wool. It's not been super washed. And even though I used the same kettle dyeing technique that I used every time that I've dyed yarn, um, you, you don't get nearly as much variegation or tonal shading in this yarn as I do when I have dyed superwash yarn in the past, like sock yarn leftovers. So I can understand why a lot of hand dyers prefer superwash bases because I think it's much easier to get that tonal variation just because the regular wool takes a bit longer to soak up the colors, but there's a bit of variation in there. And I just prefer to work with regular wool because it's less processed. Yeah. So I was very pleased with how the color turned out. There it is next to my skin. My sister was really admiring it in a photo too, but this wool is too, too coarse for her to be able to wear. She's very sensitive. So my impressions of the Jacobs wool so far are that it will make a very nice sturdy hat. Um, I think maybe it's got three plies. Yep, three plies. It's not particularly bouncy, but it's also not slinky the way that the long wools are. And it's not next to the skin soft for me. Um, definitely not. But for hats, that doesn't matter because I always wear my hair over my ears, so a hat never touches any part of my skin. And I realized that for future hats, I should definitely be using the kind of wool that I want to support, but that doesn't, that I can't wear next to my skin and therefore would not make a sweater out of. Because I have a couple sweaters that are too itchy to wear next to my skin. And if I wear, one of them is fine if I wear um, a long sleeve t-shirt under it. But the other one, I just, even a long sleeve t-shirt doesn't, give me enough protection. It's still itchy, so I wouldn't want this for a sweater. But I'm sure it will be a lovely, sturdy hat. And I think it's really nice to combine a sturdier yarn with the lace pattern because I think it'll help keep more warmth in and waterproofness. It was kind of fun. I was knitting this last night while watching Full Steam Ahead, which is a BBC documentary. And it Features the same historians who have done the historical farm shows, which I really enjoy. And one of the episodes, they go to Wales and they look at Jacob's sheep. So it was very fun to be knitting this while watching the Jacob's sheep running about the hills. And this is Wovember month, which is a British campaign in favor of wool and I think mainly British wool, like it's British based and it has a political agenda as well and it has a really fabulous website so I'm thinking of this as my Wovember project because it's British wool and the pattern is inspired by a Scottish artist who is not British but still UK so yeah that is my hat oh the other thing I wanted to say I have had problems with this chart um, some of them are my fault because I use I use my phone to read patterns, so I zoom in on the chart, and sometimes when I zoom in, I cut off key information. So I've had to rip twice, and then I had to stare at my hat and like knit a few stitches and rip back and knit a few stitches and rip back for a good 15 minutes before figuring out another problem. The first time I had to rip seven rows because I didn't realize that the chart only shows odd number rows. I thought it was really weird that there was lace knitting going on on every round and that it didn't look like it was forming a pattern. But it wasn't until I got, until I finished like row seven 
and I can't remember, oh, I moved it over a little bit because I knew that I needed to do something special on row nine, and then suddenly I realized, I saw the numbers on the column and realized that they were only odd numbers. So that was partly my fault, but the pattern tells you to do the chart following the directions for your size. So I looked at the size, and I feel like in those little directions, which are quite brief, they could have added a sentence saying that the chart only uses even numbers. Instead, they have that, or only odd numbers. Instead, they have that sentence above the key to the chart. And I don't usually look at keys to charts because I usually find the symbols pretty self-evident. But it was still mainly my fault. And then the other times, it's just, especially the early rounds, like I would say until round 15, there's, there's not always symmetry going on in the chart, and I at least, usually when I look at a chart, I can see about how the knitting should look, and so I can read my knitting, my knitting quite easily while I'm working on the project. But this chart just, I don't know, like I'm just following what it tells me to do and hoping that that's what's supposed to happen for those early rounds because it wasn't quite symmetrical, it was kind of quirky, and so I really had to pay quite a bit of attention. And then what had happened that made me like muddled and confused is that I had accidentally dropped a yarn over. So I was a stitch off right at the beginning. But I sorted it out and after row 15, it became a lot more intuitive because these ones are symmetrical. So that shape. And I've got, 12 more rounds before I begin my crown decreases, so it's going fairly quickly. I'm knitting the children's size. It comes in baby, toddler, child, adult, small, slash medium, and adult large. And I read several of the projects before I cast on, and quite a few of them mentioned that when they knit the adult small, it came out too big for them. And when I looked at the numbers, the number of stitches to cast on for the child size brim is the number of stitches that I would normally cast on for a half brim in this weight yarn. So I just went ahead and followed the child directions. And I'm really glad that I didn't make it any bigger because, as you can see, obviously it'll be taller. Um, it's the right size. I don't need it any larger. And my hat, my head is 22 inches in diameter. It's not what they describe as the child size diameter. This was beating up her bed over in the corner. So take that for what you will. I didn't do a gauge swatch though, so I don't know if my gauge is on. This is my Miss Lemon Jumper, which I have been working on since July. I realized after I recorded my last Project Snapshot episode that I had just wound up the third skein, which meant that I had only knit 880 yards since July. And that is unusual for me because in a heavier weight sweater, I can knit a sweater that takes 1,000 to 1,200 yards in six to eight weeks. So clearly I just wasn't picking up this sweater enough and that's part of why it was taking so long because July to what? July to August, August to September, September to October. So I'm looking at my fourth month of this sweater and it was just silly that I hadn't knit more yards on it. So I decided to make sure that I was giving it the same attention as the rest of my projects. I think since in my mind it's a lace weight sweater, it's going to take a very long time knitting at a gauge of 11 stitches per inch. And so there wasn't an urgency about it. And so when I was rotating between projects, I probably always rotated between this one last. So my other projects were just getting worked on more. So I stopped accidentally ignoring it and as you can see I've made a whole lot of progress I was right around here last time and now I am almost up to the back neck shaping this is the back piece of the sweater I blocked it and it turned out my gauge was still good it had not changed so I did you can see the fabric blocked versus unblocked I, I was very relieved to find that my gauge hadn't changed I know that I was worried about that last time See, I'm really happy with how this is progressing now, and I, I actually plan to take this home with me when I go home for Christmas because since there are so many yards in just 50 grams, I think it'll be a great travel project since I have the stitch memorized at this point.
The only thing I wanted to talk about is this is a self-designed sweater. I'm using a custom fit pattern for the numbers and that kind of thing, but I added a stitch pattern of my own design. Well, I'm sorry. I found a stitch pattern in a stitch dictionary and I added it. And one thing I hadn't thought of because I haven't done an all over design like this on a sweater before, and so it just didn't occur to me, is that I didn't center it. Instead what I did was I, because the stitch, like it divided pretty evenly into my number of stitches, and so I just started a repeat and worked across. So I had it planned so that it would meet up perfectly at the side seams and be very continuous once I seam it together. But what I hadn't realized is that because I planned it that way, instead of centering a motif here and making sure it was symmetrical, when I got to the armhole decreases, they didn't match. Um, you know, so basically, if you can see on this side, once I when I was doing the armhole stitches, I started with that kind of look. And on this side, I can't see, so hopefully you can. It's not the same, right? It's like one motif off. And I am very much, I suppose, a symmetrical orderly person. So I was a little taken aback. I wasn't going to rip it all back because 11 stitches per inch. Each of these little circles represents 16 rows. Um, so what I did was I did a little bit of fancy, fancy dancing, I guess. What's the idiom I want? I can't remember it, but basically I fiddled with the decreases just a little and I managed to get it so that the two sides look symmetrical up here. They look a little wonky around here. Hang on, maybe if I pull it back, you'll be able to see. Um, but once I finished all of the decreases for the armhole shaping, both sides were doing the same thing. And that was a big relief for me. So as you can see, the very edge does not fit evenly into the motifs. Maybe. Um, so all I've been doing there is basically for full motifs, anytime you're knitting in the center of one of the circles, you're purling in the center of the other one. Um, and so for these edges, I just did the same thing. I switched to knitting when this one was purling, and then I switched to purling when this one switched to knitting. And then I just do uh, one yarn over or one decrease in each motif, whereas a full motif has either two decreases or two yarn overs for each of the right side rows. So that kept everything in pattern and looking pretty good, I think. I'm really glad that I knit the back piece first because now I know that I should center the pattern for the front piece instead of doing it so that the side seams will match up. That does mean that the side seams, when I seam them, aren't going to be perfect. There will be a break in the pattern, but I think that that's less important than having, uh, having the pattern center in the middle because when you're interacting with people, they're looking at this. They're not looking at this. So that is all for that. I'm really excited. I think I'm about 20 rows, maybe, maybe a little more than that from the end of this. So pretty thrilling. Haven't decided whether I'll cast on for the other sleeve or the front piece first, but that put, that puts me at pretty much the halfway mark. The other project that is new, new for you guys, very old for me, is the chief throw. Let me make sure I'm showing the right side. It is a blanket, in case the project name didn't give it away. It's a free pattern from Red Heart that I cannot remember, but as you can see, it's cables and lace. And I chose this pattern. It's a blanket for my father because my dad was uh, a career Air Force man. He was in the Air Force for 30 years, and he was a Chief Master Sergeant for at least 10 of them. I can't remember exactly when he was promoted. And a Chief Master Sergeant is the highest rank you can have if you are enlisted. Basically, when you join the military, there's two ranks. You can either be enlisted or you can be an officer. And then each of those big groups 
you proceed up the ranks accordingly. So um, my father was very good at his job and he really loved it. He only retired after 30 years because you have to. So I thought that doing an Air Force themed blanket would be a very good idea for him. This yarn is Barocco Ultra Alpaca, the worsted weight. So it's 50% wool, 50% alpaca. And I believe this is the ocean heather colorway. So it's looking a little brighter on screen than it is in real life. It's not a cobalt in real life, it's a navy, but as you can see, so my navy sweater is much blacker. So this is certainly a lighter and bluer navy than a really dark navy. Let's, nope, that just lightens it up more. So I started this project two years ago. <laughs> and I knit, I think, three or four, three skeins worth, and I realized that I was going to need more yarn because I started with five skeins, and that wasn't going to be enough. And so I put it into hibernation while deciding what to do, and finally I just ordered a couple more skeins, and then I worked on it for a little bit more, and then summer arrived, so I put it in hibernation because I didn't want a lap full of wool, and then I just kind of ignored it for a year because it turns out I don't really enjoy knitting blankets. <laughs> So I decided that with Christmas knitting this year, this is going to be my second priority after faux thistle. So I went ahead and pulled it out as soon as I had finished faux thistle and I wound up another skein of the yarn. And then I got cold feet because this is a wool alpaca blend and so it's not super wash or anything and that means it can't go in the dryer. And I wasn't really sure if a blanket that can't be machine dried is usable. For me, because of my pets, I have to, well, because I have pets and I have a very small apartment, so I don't have space to air dry a, a blanket. And I do have to wash them on occasion because of my lovely pets. So for me, that would have been a deal breaker. And so I was thinking about ripping it out and re-knitting a scarf and hat and mitten set for my dad. But I had already knit like two thirds of the blanket. And so finally I decided that rather than surprise him, I would just text him and ask. And he said that he would definitely use a blanket like this and he seemed very excited about it. So that was a relief and now I can knit without having to worry. I really don't like having to worry how gifts are going to be received, even if I do sacrifice the element of surprise. He doesn't know the color or, you know, that it's an Air Force Chevron theme. Oh, I should clarify. The reason why this reminds me of um, the Air Force is that the rank insignia that you wear on your sleeves are chevrons. So, and you get more chevrons as you increase in rank. So, as a chief, he had quite a few chevrons. So, when I started knitting this two years ago, obviously I wasn't a very experienced knitter yet, and it was quite complicated for me. It's got lace on every right side row, and then every wrong side row is a different knit purl number stitch count and then every 20 rows or so you do a pretty big cable and so when I pulled it out I was very curious to see whether it would still feel like a complicated knit and I'm finding it so much easier to knit now uh, I don't have to look so much at the pattern as I did before I can understand I can see how it's working in a way that I couldn't see before. Like I can see, you you know, I can see how these diagonals are moving around, which I couldn't before. So this has really brought home to me how much I've improved and how, how much knowledge I've acquired over the past two years of knitting. So that's kind of fun. And I have knit another skein's worth of the blanket. It turns out that one repeat, one vertical repeat, which is two cables, takes about a skein of yarn. And that means that as long as I follow the pattern, I've got one skein of yarn left to add on to it. So I think that I will have this finished within a couple weeks, hopefully. If I were to knit a blanket again, I would knit it in pieces because this is quite large at this point. It's about 40 inches wide. And I'm not sure how long, but most of my wingspan. 
and since it's worsted weight, it's very heavy. So even though I keep as much of the weight on the cable as possible, it's still, it's a little tricky to work that way. So if I were to do a blanket again, I would want to do it in pieces just for the weight factor. I have to go get my bread out of the oven and then I will be back. Bread's out. I thought I would go ahead and show you a photo I happen to have of my dad at his retirement ceremony from the Air Force so that you can see the insignia that I am talking about. Am I too close to focus? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, that's the chevron pattern that indicates rank in the Air Force. Obviously, this is not in color, but Air Force uniforms are navy blue and white. And you can just see you've got a chest full of medals because, as I said, he was very good at his job and he loved it. My mother was in the Air Force, too, actually. That's where they met and married. And that's why I was born in Athens, Greece. But once I came along, she took an honorable discharge. So she was in for, I believe, seven years. So, yeah, definitely an Air Force brat for me. My final project is my Friny jumper, and I believe I showed you the swatches last time. And I, uh, once again, this is a self-designed sweater, but I am using a custom fit pattern for the numbers and shaping and that kind of thing, because if you sign up for an account with them and you buy your first pattern within 30 days, you get a credit for another pattern. So I thought I would go ahead and use that credit now. So I started with a sleeve. I like doing that. I believe I read about it or heard about it on Knit FM with Pam Allen. She recommends starting with a sleeve. But one of my friends on Instagram said that Meg Swanson, Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter, also recommends starting with a sleeve when you're knitting a sweater. And that's just because it's a smaller piece than the front and back. So if you find out you have any weird gauge changes or something like that, you're there will be less frogging involved. So here's the sleeve that I'm currently working on. This is Canopy Fingering Yarn in the Sarsaparilla colorway. I love this yarn. It's 30% baby alpaca, no, 30% merino wool, 50% baby alpaca, and 20% uh, bamboo rayon. I might be making those numbers up, but the, it's really soft and really drapey, and it's this beautiful silvery brown color. And I am doing the Poderie Anglaise stitch pattern. You can find a link to it on the project page if you're interested in finding out how to do it. It's very simple and relaxing. So as you can see, it's just an eyelet pattern. This is actually the second sleeve. I'm almost up to starting the arm cap shaping, but I haven't worked on it in a couple days because this will found her squeaky toy. Because, sorry. <coughs> because the, obviously I created, I generated the pattern using my own numbers from the swatch and so it told me to work to 16 inches, and then it told me how many rows that should be. And I meant the number of rows, but the sleeve is not 16 inches long. So that could be because I mismeasured my gauge swatch, because the way the Broderie Anglaise pattern is worked, it makes it a little tricky to count rows. Or it could be that the alpaca and rayon in the yarn makes it grow in blocking. So I want to stop and block this before proceeding just to see if it does. If I were a sensible knitter, I would measure my gauge swatch before I block it and then measure it after I block it and I would know whether the yarn changes with blocking uh, without having to block sweater pieces. And I always mean to do that, and then I always forget because I get really excited when I finish my gauge swatch and I throw it right in the sink with the soapy water, and then it's too late. So maybe I'll remember for the next sweater, but yeah, so that's why I have paused on this and will be, uh, I wanted, I didn't want to 
block it until after I recorded this because I decided I was going to block it on, I think, Thursday or Friday, and I knew it wouldn't be dry by Sunday when I record. So for you guys, I held off. I'm just doing twisted one by one ribbing on the cup with a provisional cast on because that's my favorite. And this is actually not the first sleeve that I knit. This is the first one. So you can see I didn't get as far. When I was talking about the swatch, I mentioned that I was thinking about trying having more concentrated eyelets at the bottom and making them less concentrated as I went up. And even though I really liked that on the gauge swatch, I didn't think it looked as good on the sleeve. It looks a bit messy to me, and I think that's because of the cuff and because the sleeve, of course, is longer than the gauge swatch. So I decided to just evenly space my eyelets for the entire the entire length of this sleeve and I really like how that's turning out. I think that this distribution of eyelets will work for the body too because it's still a pretty opaque fabric so that's really nice. I wasn't sure if I would have to do fewer eyelets on the body so that it wouldn't be see-through but I don't think you can really see my hand behind that. So, And I am working the eyelets I work four plain rows in between every eyelet, and the eyelets take four rows as well. So basically four plain rows, four patterned rows, four plain rows, four patterned rows. And then uh, there are six stitches in between each eyelet, whereas the basic directions have you do four stitches between each eyelet, and there are no plain rows in between. You're always doing eyelets in one or the other. So. Mine is definitely a little more spaced out. And as always, that will be on my project page. I don't do project notes for these kinds of episodes, but I try really hard to include all of the modifications and techniques and stitch patterns that I talk about on the project page for anyone who wants to reference them. If I leave something off, you can always leave a comment on Ravelry and I will get it back on. Yeah. So, and here's that gauge swatch I was talking about that has the more... And you can see how much drapier this is than the pre-blocked fabric. So I have a feeling that it's going to grow once I block it. That is everything that I've been working on. Come on, Tessa. She's being restless today, probably because I had friends over last night, so we all sat around talking, and she just got to sit next to all of us and be pet for hours. I thought that I would do something a little different and talk about a future project that I'm planning because I would like your advice. So today on Instagram, one of my knitting friends, Luli, oh, I think, yeah, Luli Instamatic, something like that. Sorry. She posted that she has created a sock ad advent calendar, which I thought was such a fun idea. And it turns out that she got the idea from another knitter, and there's actually a knit-along being run in a Ravelry group. And obviously, I'll include more information on that when I start the sock. But basically, uh, the idea is to do scrappy socks, or they're also called Franken socks. And you add a little bit every day between December 1st and 24th. And I thought that was a really neat idea, and I have a lot of sock yarn scraps because I don't want to do a sock yarn blanket and my socks generally take 60 to 70 grams. So I always have leftovers. And so I got out my box of leftovers today and I dug through them and I found five colors that I think would be nice and Christmassy together. And oops, there's the last one. So Oops. Ah. Okay. Difficult to hold on to. You saw these on Instagram if you follow me there. But, uh, yeah. And I think I'm going to use the Cranberry Biscotti pattern, which is a slip stitch stripe pattern that I really like the look of. I've been wanting to knit it forever. But I've never done scrappy socks before, and I'm not really sure how I should approach color management. As I'm sure you know, if you have watched any of my podcasts before, I like orderly things. I like control, so I will certainly not be leaving it up to chance, and I will not be making fraternal socks. They will match. <laughs> 
I wish I wish I could enjoy random stripes and unmatching socks. Maybe I'll maybe I'll try to do slightly fraternal socks. Maybe I could let go that far. Anyway, so what I'm thinking is I have about double the amount of gold or ochre yarn as I do the other colors. This is ultra alpaca fine in case you were wondering. And so I thought that maybe I should make every other stripe in the yellow and then um, alternate and have different colors in between all of the yellow stripes. And that might be a way to add some cohesion to the scrappiness. And in that case, I could randomly alternate the colors that aren't yellow. And I think that that would be okay with me. I wouldn't um, mind having mismatched socks, if that makes sense. So maybe I'll leave it up to chance that way. But I would love to hear from you if you make scrappy socks, how you go about approaching the color. Like, do you let it, do you leave it up to chance and does that work out? Or do you make sure that one color is dominant? Like, I could do the yellow dominant. Or, yeah, I've just never done scrappy socks before. So this would be all new to me. But I really like the idea. And I think these will make nice Christmas socks. Although I fly home on the 22nd, so I might cheat and do the last couple of days of my advent calendar early so that the socks are done. We'll see. That is all that I have to talk about today. I would really love to hear your input on scrappy socks and that kind of thing, as well as, of course, your input on anything that I'm knitting or any questions you might have. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as The Charm of It, all one word, and those links are always on YouTube as well. I love hearing comments from you on YouTube or Instagram or messages in Ravelry or in the podcast group on Ravelry, which is also The Charm of It. Basically, any way you get in touch, I'm always very excited about. And I am just so happy that you wanted to sit down and join me while I talk about my knitting, whether you are a returning viewer or just trying me out for the first time. I really appreciate it. I hope that you have a wonderful knitting week, and I will see you next time. Bye!